teach your children well. When we become parents, we find out quickly that when our little ones are not feeling well, our whole world changes. This time, On Call looks at pediatrics, all things great and small. The doctors are on call tonight. Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System and Fishback Financial Corporation. There's the, the bell. And which was healthier, the yogurt and the bagel? I'm going to start by measuring the size of it. You could also add grilled chicken to this recipe. Whole red handle to open bag. A hospital dedicated only for children opened in Paris in 1802, but there have been manuscripts devoted to pediatrics since the second century AD in Greece when, and then Persia and then in 1472 in Italy. The specialty of pediatrics in medicine is relatively new, however, starting in Germany in the late 1800s and evolving from there. The specialty of family medicine is even newer, developing after World War II in the U.S. when medical advancements demanded that the general practitioner had more than a one-year internship. The family physician training includes not only the broad scope of obstetrics, minor surgery, but also internal medicine and general pediatrics. In fact, most family physicians find themselves providing a great deal of pediatric or child care to patients from birth to adulthood. If one Googles pediatric care, there is a huge array of topics that are presented there from immunization issues, prevention of head trauma with bicycle helmets, wellness exams for the infant and up, bullying issues at school, teen drivers, congenital heart disease identification, athletic physicals in high school students, prevention of sudden death, and the list goes on. The topic of pediatric lends itself to an opportunity for you, the home audience, to ask a wide breadth of questions of our specialists tonight. You can, if you're a grandparent, if you're a parent, if you have a relative that's a child, you know, think about issues that you could talk uh, and ask us about. We invite you at home to call with your questions. Our phone number is 1-888-376-6225. Again, that is 1-888-376-6225. We have as guests tonight family physician Dr. Shelby Eichens of the Avera Medical Group Brookings and pediatrician Dr. Craig Crisman of the Brown Clinic Watertown. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Shelby, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're brand new to Brookings, I mean relatively, and from whence did you come and where did you train? Um, well, I originally was introduced into South Dakota and during residency. I did residency in Sioux Falls, and then we moved closer to home, and then that's where I started initially my practice in Park Rapids, Minnesota for about four and a half years, and then um, circumstances brought us back to the Brookings area, and I've been here for a year and a half, and it's going very and well. And you're working on we now have an electronic medical record, which you just yes. love. Yes, it's so <laughs> exciting. <laughs> so that's what's happening And nerve-wracking, but, you know, I think it gets a little bit, a little bit easier every day. But. Uh, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Craig, you're uh, from Watertown. Are you originally from Watertown? No, I, I grew up in the Tampa Bay area of Florida, but my mom was from South Dakota, and she went to Sioux Falls College, so that's where I went and did my undergraduate work. 
and then I went to med school at the University of South Dakota. I went back to University of Florida for my pediatric training and then moved moved back to South Dakota. So and now then Florida to South Dakota, so it's kind of like my wife who came all the way up here. Of course, she came because I dragged her up here. You did your did your wife drag you up to South Dakota? No, my my wife is originally from Minnesota, and we met in in, in Watertown. Oh, and so you've been in Watertown for how long? For eighteen and a half years now. Great, yes. and I know you have a special interest in diabetes. Yes, I'm the medical director of the South Dakota Diabetes Camp, Camp Gilbert. This summer will be my twenty second year of doing diabetes okay. camp. Oh wow, that's exciting. That's a, an inter are you diabetic? Um, no, I've just developed an interest in residency and s did my first two years of diabetes camp down in Florida and then when I moved to South Dakota I called and asked if they had a diabetes camp here and I actually went to camp before I started in practice in, in Watertown. I was at a, a blind camp one time, that was another revelation I can tell you. Those camps for special uh, illness patients, people with special illnesses have been very helpful I think. Well, and there's so many of them. I mean, asthma and there's know, an asthma camp. Yep, and diabetes and um, some for other special there's, needs there's kids. There's cancer camps and hemophilia yep, camps yep, and there's, bereavement it's just camps and yeah, many different needs and camps lend themselves to kids. Well, camps are fun. That's that's our main goal at diabetes camp is to give them a fun experience because most of the time the parents wouldn't feel comfortable sending them to Bible camp or Boy Scout camp because of their special right. medical needs. And at camp we can provide that safety net. There's approximately three campers for every staff member, so we can watch. We can handle it. We can watch them carefully and. We find that kids, even from Sioux Falls, may not know other kids with diabetes. They feel mm -hmm. like, I'm the only person mm -hmm. in the universe who has to deal with this. And mm -hmm. at camp, all the campers and probably half the staff have diabetes. And so those of us without diabetes are the minority for a week. And so it's a quite, quite educational. We try to bring in at least one big guest speaker every year, plus the ch children learn from each other so much. Well, I, isn't that true? I bet they, they really catch the information from their buddies, the yep. newfound buddies that are la long lasting. Exactly, and you know, now with email, they are <coughs> contacting each other throughout the year and they can keep those relationships going. Yeah. Shelby, uh, you, have, you take care of a fair amount of diabetics? No, I don't have a whole lot of children with diabetes specifically, no. Adults? Um, some adults. You know, my practice is pretty, pretty much, um, because I do OB, so I, I grab a lot of the younger population, so a lot of children, um, young adults, uh, women, and then I have a lot of uh, female, you know, older generation. Uh, but so I don't have Tons far, of diabetic. No, not a whole lot, but. So uh, if, you th if you looked at the, the world of, of pediatrics, I'll ask you be first, and then I'll mm -hmm. ask you this. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are the major illnesses or the problems that pediatrics, you know, what, you know, 50% are respiratory, 30% are emotional, 10% are, you know, are accidents or what would be your, your percentages of what you see in pediatrics? Um, I don't know. I would say a good majority of children are just healthy, run-of-the-mill um, children. Wellness checks. Yes, yes. Or... Um, URIs, you know, upper, upper respiratory rest. infections, um, like the RSV we've been seeing lately, um, which has been great fun. And um, I, I would say that that encompasses a good majority, you know, injuries, lacerations, things like that yeah. we see a lot. Yeah. Um, but I think that's probably a good majority of what I see in my practice mm -hmm. anyway. Um, now, you're pure pediatrics. So what, it, it, would you echo the same percentages or where are you at? Probably. I mean, a lot of what, what I see are infectious disease of some, some variety or another. Mm -hmm. you know, most of them, thankfully, minor infectious th disease, but that's where I spend a, a, lot, of, a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. And then I have a special interest in ADHD and some of the behavioral pediatrics, and so I, I do a fair amount of that in addition to, to taking care of people with diabetes. And, at our clinic, I tend to handle all the patients who are on insulin pumps, and so some of my, my patients are in, in their 70s, and so it's kind of fun. So I you have, to, they I were once a child. They once were a child. <laughs> they can relate to me. Yeah. 
<laughs> so you do the insulin pumps in the clinic? Yes. So most of the patients who are on insulin pumps at the clinic come, come and see me and I help them with their, their pump settings. Yeah. So that's good. interesting. It's yeah. a different, it's yeah, a different percentage of that. things. Yeah, that that's good. You're doing that up there. That's wonderful. One of the things I was going to start with, <laughs> and uh, we can kind of move from there, is the issue of abuse, child abuse. It's a, it's a topic that uh, I, I've, as an adult doctor, you know, I, I look at adults who were abu abused as child, as children. Mm -hmm. I spoke with one friend of mine who is a counselor today who called me and she said, you've got to go to the, the, the movie um, uh, uh, Safe House, where uh, this experience of these people were in the CIA, they didn't have anybody they could trust, mm -hmm. and there was all of this um, abuse stuff going on, and that's happening to our Army people, I think, our, our armed forces, that there's this trauma that's going on. But if you take it to a, a childhood level, are we seeing, do we, do we know that there's a lot of abuse? What is it, what is, how much of it is out there? Um, Unfortunately, there is quite a bit of abuse when you include all the various types of abuse, physical abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. That's, there's a lot of it. That's quite a, quite a bit, and you know, we, we're exposed, exposed to it through daily, you know, daily practice. And, it's not an area that I particularly enjoy doing because it's always always difficult to, to meet their, their special needs and, right. and it's, but it's it's also part of the reality of being a pediatrician. You have to have to mm -hmm. learn to yeah. deal with that. Mm -hmm. My friend, the counselor, says when, when there's child abuse, that uh, that causes such a lifelong trauma to that person as they grow up. That it, they just can't, almost sometimes can't pull out of uh, of it. Shelby, any comments about abuse? Well, you know, in terms of the law, I mean, there's short-term consequences. Obviously, I mean, you have kids who aren't um, eating appropriately, and that you know, if in that terms of neglect, um, the uh, physical trauma sometimes that you see, which is very sad to see. Mm -hmm. um, and difficult to see, um, but then there's also the emotional stuff that, and that's the stuff that, that you don't really see initially until probably they get a little bit older, and then you start to see more of the behavioral ha patterns, um, and that's I think uh, when you kind of start to delve into that issue, um, and then there's you know, and especially with well, I think in all those aspects, um, as they get older, it's something that carries with them and. Then when they get into teenagers and go on, hopefully, on to college and stuff, and they're on their own, now they're having to deal with it and their relationships in the future and... The lack of ability to trust. Exactly. Uh, you exactly. know, you can measure a broken bone or a cigarette burn, but sometimes you really can't uh, measure the, the screaming and the, the, physical, the emotional mm -hmm. abuse that mm -hmm. people get. Well, we all have some of that in our childhood. I mean, I, I, can, I don't think we can get past it. We live in a world where our kids abuse other kids, and, right. and, yeah. and none of yeah. us are f uh, free of it. So that's, right. But some right. of it get too, people get too much of that right. stuff. And now it's in the social media, you know. We've got the smartphones and, and the, the um, Facebooks, and they're bullying each other yeah. all over. I mean, it's, it's everywhere now. I mean, they can't even go home and feel safe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. if it's a, if it's a um, peer um, abuse kind of issue. Yeah. But sure. Craig, any comment? Yeah, just this, as she pointed out, the cyber bullying is getting to be more and more prevalent, and unfortunately, it's way too easy to, to bully people over social media and can cause trauma. and. Obviously, quite a few suicides have been in the national news related directly to the cyberbullying phenomenon. Yeah. It's, it's a real deal. It is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tragically, children are often caught in the middle of domestic or criminal actions of their parents, and the court often becomes the battleground for abuse cases. While the adults usually have lawyers fighting for them, CASA, court-appointed special advocates, are now available to ensure that the rights of the children involved are taken into consideration when the judge decides the outcome. When the Department of Social Services removes a child and they come into state 
into the state custody, they notify us that there's going to be an initial hearing or a 48 hour hearing. And at that time we attend the hearing um, and sometimes it, it depends on kind of the, the direction that they feel the case is going to go. The judge may appoint us at that time. And when we are initially appointed, the judge appoints the program um, to monitor the case. And then once we get a little bit further into it, then the program appoints appoints a volunteer. Nationally, CASA has been around since the early, the mid-70s. Um, judge David Sokup was a, a family court judge in Seattle, Washington, and he had a number of abuse and neglect cases coming before him in the court. And he said at the end of the day when he went home, when he had criminal hearings or criminal cases in front of him, he felt comfortable with the decisions that he was making. But when he had abuse and neglect cases, he didn't feel that he had all of the information that he needed to be able to make sound decisions for the future of the children. And he knew that there had to be a way to get the information that he felt as though he was missing. And so he recruited and trained some community volunteers and told them what he was looking for and sent them out to be the eyes and the ears of the of the court. For East Central CASA, for this program, last year we provided advocacy services to 52 children throughout the five counties that we serve. Um, with about 27 volunteers. That's what everybody wants, is for this family to be fixed and to, and to be able to be reunited because no matter how awful the situation is for the children, they want to go home for the most part with mom and dad. That's what they know, that's what their life is, and they want to be with their families. So how often do you think a uh, situation, I mean, do you run into this in your practice at all? I mean, where you have to be involved with a court and that there's trouble with family and court happening and you've involved with ca CASA, either one of you? I have not. Um, there have been a few cases where I've, um, you know, when I, when I worked in Minnesota, our resource was in Fargo, so there was one child specifically that I referred to there and they just kind of took care of it. But um, I've been involved after the fact, you know, when they're in the foster cares and dealing with the behaviors and and those kind of things. But. Yeah. We're obligated by law, aren't we, when we think there might mm -hmm. be abuse. How does that go, Craig? Well, all, all physicians and medical personnel are mandated reporters, and so if we even suspect abuse, then we're mandated to contact social mm -hmm. services and at least let them know. So and then they investigate. It's not our job to investigate and determine yeah. is it abuse. It's our job to, to report and let them do the investigation. So here you have a parent and a child and you think there might be abuse and so you walk in the room and say I'm calling social services on you and of course that's the last time they'll ever be in your office. You'll not be able to help them uh, so you kind of have to realize that this might happen. Have you had scenarios where you've had to report? Yeah, unfortunately I have to report a fair, fair number of cases and as more and more families are being divorced then you know both both parents are accusing the other one of abuse and sometimes it's hard to know <laughs> how much is, it, is a real issue versus you know they're just mad at their their ex-spouse and so, so that makes it even more difficult to, to sort out I think. Oh wow. Well we've got some questions. What, any other comments? No. I was just going to say it's just a very difficult topic and but it's it's one of those things you kind of have to be prepared for a little bit. Right. I remember as one much as you can. Well, I remember one time I was in the emergency room and the uh, court or the, the court appointed person said, now I'm, Dr. Holm, I'm wanting you to evaluate whether this parent is abusing this child. And of course it was a split, this is the husband, the wife is saying that the husband is abusing the child. And I'm watching this little boy who is very loquacious and chatty and clever and very loving of his dad. I mean, he's really playing. His dad, his dad's playing. They're both having fun. It's an interactive deal. I mean, it's a, a wonderful interactive mm -hmm. moment. And there was some. I had to ask the kid if he, you know, and I, I don't. His answers were not uh, convincing to me. And I looked at the love between the dad and the son, and I thought, I said to the, the social services person, I'm not going to report this guy. But now it might have been occurring, but I can't imagine it was very hard. Mm -hmm. If it was a spanking, it might not have been. Well, 
Well, and that's the thing is, you know, you can, I mean, one little visit with you, I mean, it doesn't really tell the whole story. I mean, you're only seeing a little piece of their day um, of, you know, maybe, um, especially when they get older, you're seeing them maybe once a year if, if they don't bring them in, you know, except for their well visits. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's very difficult to um, discover that specifically. Um, so I, I tell parents, aunts, uncles, just kind of, if you suspect it, you just need to let somebody know as well. Because yeah. they're going to probably see it more than we will. Yeah, you call social services. And then yeah. I won't have to deal. Ooh, it gets tough. Wow. Well, so, but they should. Or bring should. them in. Or bring them in, and I'll, I'll help yeah, you with it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Nope. Here's a shift of topics. Let's talk about the heart. Kid's heart. Now, I mean, you know, I remember when I got my ears and I started listening, and I got to a point where I can hear a murmur on just about everybody, mm -hmm. particularly pregnant mm -hmm. women, certainly young mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a flow murmur almost. Right. You right. can hear this little, you know, lub dub, yeah. which is very common. Right. Do they all need a heart echo when you hear a murmur? No. I mean, as you said, it's been my experience as well that almost 100% of children and teenagers will have a heart murmur at, at some point, especially if I see them and they have fever, they're excited, they're anxious, and their heart rate is up, then it makes the murmur more, more obvious. But you have to look at what else is going on with that that child or adolescent, are they having any symptoms related to potential right. heart problems? If they're asymptomatic, if they're growing without well. Without symptoms, asymptomatic, that's, without symptoms. That's, that's correct. If they're not having you know, excessive sweating, if they're able to keep up with their, their peers and run around and have good exercise they can play tolerance well. and can play, then they're, they probably do not have a serious congenital heart, heart problem. Yeah. That's your take? Yeah, I mean, you hear heart murmurs all the time. In fact, just the other day, I saw a kid, high fever, and I'm like, Mom, has this child ever had a murmur before? No. And I said, well, she has a little murmur, but it's because she has a fever, and, you know, I just want to let you know some of these murmurs are benign, and, you know, some of what you hear. I mean, there's different murmurs, right. um, and this one sounded like one of those benign ones. And, right. you know, at the end of the visit, that was the one she thinks she keyed on is, you know, is this yeah, something yeah. that we have to <laughs> deal with? And I said, no, it's a benign thing. And I bet you when she comes in next week and she's perfectly healthy, I may yeah. not hear it or it's going to mm -hmm. be much softer. And yeah. Well, so. and murmurs, I mean, goodness gracious, uh, I'd read the echoes and uh, the adults mostly. I don't read mm -hmm. the kids, uh, mm -hmm. the young kids' echoes. But there's a lot of benign leaks, you know, a little yeah. leaky tricuspid mm -hmm. valve or mitral valve. and, and you. They, they account for the murmurs. Is there a danger? Well, you know, there could be, listen to that murmur, and if it's changing, let's repeat the echo in five years, and then we'll see if there's been a change in the flow. But that's about right. it. Right. Uh, there are definite significant murmurs that need to be monitored. And, well, let's talk about the athletic uh, exam and the guy who dies suddenly. Who, how do we recognize the person, you know, who suddenly dies in the, on the athletic field? I mean, we, you know, Going to the doctor or somebody to have a pre-athletic physical, is that going to pick up that guy? Not necessarily. I mean, unfortunately, unless we're doing echocardiograms and ultrasound of the heart on all these, these athletes, not only initially but throughout their athletic careers, some of the subtle things that do cause sudden death are not going to be, be picked up. The, the bigger question is, you know, is it cost effective to Echo to, to echo everyone, which would potentially pick up some of these, but how many hundreds of thousands of dollars do you have to right. have to spend to pick up one one positive, and then will that really change the the outcome? Those are the the hard questions relating. Yeah. And to And what that. are you going to do? You're going to put them on a pill. Do you want to put them on a pill, thinking maybe that the the calcium channel blocker might protect them? What is the major uh, heart? abnormality that we that these people die from suddenly well it's usually enlargement of the left ventricle of, of the heart it's called hypertrophy the the, the heart muscle is, is, is thickened and most of the cases of sudden death are related to to that 
Right, this, this obstructive cardiomyopathy. And you don't pick it up because uh, there's no murmur. Right. Right. I think the real clue, if there's a take home, is is there a family history of sudden death? Mm -hmm. Or is there a family history of, uh, of IHSS, which is the old word for obstructive cardiomyopathy, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. uh, so idiopathic, hypertrophic, subaortic stenosis is IHSS, which is that hypertrophy, that thickening of the heart muscle right. that blocks the outflow out the aortic valve. Mm -hmm. So if you have a family history, I think it's worthwhile, and before your kid goes to play, uh, that there's sudden death in the family, Definitely. then get it a go. Yes. Or, or um, deaths that there's really no apparent cause, especially in young people. Like they have a car accident, for instance, and they never really figured out, well, why did they get in a car accident? Right, um, they just drove um, into the ditch yeah, exactly, and what exactly. happened? So, um, family history of that. Family history is very, very important, and if you have that family history, you need to be screened for sure. There's a, there are certain people who are suggesting that cardiac screening occur on all pre-athletics, uh, and I heard a, a, phys a physician give a presentation that said it is not cost-effective. It is, I mean, if you if you have the machine and you're the guy who's doing the screening, mm -hmm. you're going to make all these people c come through this, and you're going to profit. All these people and the insurance company and the government mm -hmm. are going to have to pay for all these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. it worth it? And if you balance the, the value, uh, this particular expert said no. And you, do you agree? I, I'd agree. If you look at the strict economics, it's, it does not make sense. You know, if it's your child that's being picked up with an abnormality, you'll have a different viewpoint. But looking at it from a societal point of view, it's not, not a cost-effective option at this this time. Right. We're looking at uh, health care reform. Uh, dollars are limited. Mm -hmm. there's, we're, there's money, we're spending way more than we have. The people who are going to be needing it aren't, aren't going to be able to. We've got to figure out how to control this cost. This might be one beginning. What about uh, automatic insulin pump? We have a caller in from Sisseton that's talking about children using automatic insulin pumps. Are they expensive? Are they durable for active kids? Are they dangerous? Does insurance usually cover them? What about that? Well, insurance companies are doing a very good job of covering insulin pumps now. I mean, virtually 100% of, of insurance companies will cover the pump. Because if they, the doctor orders it. If the doctor orders it, because they now know it's a very cost-effective way to keep that child healthy. Because the insulin pump administers a a small amount of insulin continuously and you can adjust that throughout the day how much insulin is being given and then for higher blood sugars or if the child is going to eat then you, they take extra insulin to cover that. Okay. And at diabetes camp last year I think 80 percent of our campers were on on pumps. Every wow. year that number has has gone up and so I, ex I expect at least 90 percent will be on pumps this this year. It's 90 percent? Correct. Wow. And they can be in, um, I have a, a colleague, Ashley, in uh, Minnesota who's, whose uh, son was just diagnosed at the age of two, and he's, they're looking at getting a pump for him, so yeah. it's all ages. I mean, there's the, no... There's no time, no age no limit. No age limit, no. from what I've seen anyway in my practice. Durable? But. Yes, they are quite durable. I mean, I have football players and very active people who use them all the time and they very seldom have have problems with with the pump. All right. So at the cost of they're approximately six thousand dollars. And they in a, a pump will last how many years? Um three to five years typically. And it just the like any other technology, the technology keeps improving and so the pump probably would last longer than that, but by then there's new, you want to go to the there's, better. there's new generations and more fun, <laughs> fun features, yeah. and so people want to up, upgrade and get, get a, a newer and, and potentially better pump. Uh, how about the ability to measure continuously your blood sugar level and it measured and tell your pump that it's happening? And that, that is a new, very exciting feature of the, the pumps. They now have quarter size sensors that are inserted underneath the, the skin that reports blood sugars every five minutes. And so you're getting 288 blood sugars a day. And so even if you have a patient that's trying really hard and checking seven times a day, 
you now have the ability to have 288 pieces of information every 24 hours, and so it gives you the opportunity to fine-tune their their pump settings even even more than we could before. And it may be that you do it for a week or two weeks until you have it tuned, and then just repeat that every month or two for a while. Just right. I mean, there's sensors available. You don't have to be on a pump to use a sensor. We, we put sensors on, on people who take injections as well, and sometimes it gives us a better idea what their pattern is in the middle of the night. Are they having low blood mm -hmm. sugars or high blood sugars? Mm -hmm. And then allows us to, to make those adjustments. Okay. I've used those sensors in my older people who I'm trying to figure out what's going on at home because their hemoglobin UNCs are not coming down mm -hmm. and they're telling me their blood sugars are this. So sometimes I do it just to see, like I said, in my older population, just to see what's going on truly at home. So I have, I have found it very beneficial. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, diabetes is so hard. It's so yeah. hard because sometimes when you start, <coughs> excuse me, giving them insulin, they start getting too low, which makes their counter-regulatory mechanism kick in, which makes the sugar go up to, mm -hmm. to protect them from mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. too lows. And that's all we see is the highs. Right. Oh, well, we need more insulin. Right. And the answer is, no, you need less insulin. So it's a tough deal. And then it'll make them, drive them to eat more. And so right. I am right. happy we have people who pay a lot of attention to diabetes because it is about the most complex disease I know of mm -hmm. and managing it. Yeah. Well, and, and the better you keep your blood sugars, we know the better your long-term consequences in terms of kidney disease, eye disease, peripheral vascular disease, cardiac disease, stroke, and you know, so, and not to mention potentially the, um, when they get dehydrated, especially the type ones and developing, I mean, even as bad as comas because of their sugar's going too sugar's low. Sugar's going way too or low, too high, so, yeah. or, or too, too high. high yes. So we have a caller from mm -hmm. Del Rapids, comment on the situation of people who want to restrict immunization. Why are people wanting a, a, a no immunization. What are they afraid of? I, I know I was reading about this today because this is an issue of diabetes that's coming up. And the question is, uh, how old is it, or I mean about immunizations that's coming up. How old is the fear of immunization? It's 1850s. There were societies in, in England that were fearful of it. There are still people who are fearful of it. How is your, what's your take on that? Well, yeah, um, you know, I, I obviously don't have a lot of a lot of parents that come in and you know question, but I do explain to them no matter what I'm doing, this is why we're doing it, and you know, and granted the fact that we haven't seen a lot of those illnesses that we're vaccinating, um, the the purpose of doing those shots is so that we don't see those those illnesses. I mean, we had them, we had them, we had them. We, we started did. vaccinations, we they went away, and now they're going, oh, well, we don't need these vaccinations. But there have been populations where they're not vaccinating, and, and it's showing up. I think, what, three, four years ago in Minnesota, there was an area in southwestern Minnesota where um, it was uh, measles. I, I mean, I can't remember, but it was an epidemic of, of one of those illnesses that we're trying to prevent. Protect you, against. Right, you didn't have the herd immunity exactly. that you get from the vaccine. Exactly. There was a herd, in fact, of a pe people who were not vaccinated, and there was an epidemic right there. Right, yep. right. And there's been epidemics of measles. There's been epidemics of whooping cough in the in the area, and most of those are un, unimmunized. Unimmunized people. People forget, you know, 30, 40 years ago, some of these problems were very prevalent, and now they're they're extremely rare. They're very rare, and the risks of the immunizations are very, very low. I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I started my, my training just as the first vaccine came out for Haemophilus influenza type B, a very common cause of menin, meningitis and bacterial infections. Many babies died of, of the, that type of infection, and within a few years of introduction, the numbers just dropped off dramatically and now if you're a pediatric resident you may have never have seen a case of bacterial meningitis because we vaccinate against Haemophilus influenza type B as well as Streptococcus pneumoniae the two most common causes of, of meningitis in children. The lay people and parents don't understand it. 
Vaccinations are an important part of our lives as we begin getting them at birth. Many are to prevent dangerous childhood illnesses. Some, including a newly recommended vaccination for boys, is to protect against cancer as adults. The human papilloma causes disease in women and in men. The HPV vaccine protects against the human papilloma virus, which can cause cancers in women and in men. It's just been recently approved and it's now recommended and available that boys ages 9 to 26 are available for it. However, who it's recommended for are boys 11 and 12 years of age. The human papilloma virus is one of the most commonly transmitted viruses uh, that we have. Uh, uh, it's estimated that here in South Dakota alone, we have about 52,000 people are infected with this virus. Now, most people, the virus just clears spontaneously and there's no problems. However, some people, a lot of people actually get uh, genital warts from HPV and some people get uh, cancers. In women, we have about, oh, 20 to 25 deaths per year of cervical cancer. And uh, for men, several cases of penis cancer a year. And we have three, uh, about three um, penis cancer deaths a year of uh, men in South Dakota. So this is a real virus and it can be a fatal virus. For the women, uh, the cancer is uh, cancer of the cervix, uh, also cancers of the anus and the rectum. But for boys, can get cancer of the penis plus the cancers of uh, the anus and um, the uh, rectum as well. So it's protective for the boy and the, later the man itself, but then also in future years, uh, once the boy becomes sexually active and gets married, uh, protective for his uh, spouse. And uh, throat cancer is also associated with um, the human papilloma virus, which uh, this uh, new vaccine protects against. The human papilloma vaccine is a fairly new vaccine. It was only uh, released and approved for girls about five years ago, but for boys, it's just been approved by the ACIP at the CDC just this past October. So this is something new on the list. It's a vaccine that protects against cancer, and that's very, very important. Yes, it's a safe and it's effective. It's new, we don't know what it's going to do in uh, 50 years, how protective it will be, but for what we know now, and it's been an under study for many years, and it seems to be very safe and very effective. About half the children in South Dakota are covered by what's called the VFC program, and they can get it for free. The human papillomavirus uh, is, is a large family of viruses, but the one that we're concerned about is the one that affects um, people. It's a genital disease and it's spread by uh, sexual contact. So that's why it's important that people are protected before they become sexually active. So people may find it odd that we're vaccinating children as young as uh, 11 and 12 years of age, but we're preparing them for their life as adults. So we're vaccinating against uh, a virus that can occur once they become sexually active. Thank you, Lon, for that. I mean, this is, he was here for a show a couple, three, four weeks ago, and we cornered him and said, we need you on this topic. Vaccinating against cancer in girls and boys, and now they're opening it up for boys. Craig, what is your take on this? Is this something that you're doing? Well, this is something that just is a new recommendation for the boys' side of things. And so we're at the point, at least in my practice, where parents are just beginning to ask questions about it. You know, like any other new vaccine, they're not real comfortable with going forth with it yet. But Do we know of any dangers with this? We've been doing yeah. it in girls. They're almost the same as boys. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, have we seen side effects in, in the girls that have been getting this vaccination? As a general rule, no. I mean, some, some cases have been reported of people passing out after after the vaccine and they question whether that's vaccine related or just get, just getting get a, a shot. They just get a vagal reaction, I got a yeah. shot. Right, and, right. and I think as the evidence is coming out more, it's not specifically related to that vaccine, it's just they're getting a, a shot and they may react negatively to that experience. Yeah. Right. Shelby, what's your take? Well, the biggest side effects uh, um, some of my patients have been complaining about, but I specifically ask them is some soreness, you know, obviously when you get a shot. 
Um, I've had a few who, who have developed a little bit of fluish type symptoms, body aches, just tired. Yeah. But it generally doesn't last more than 24 hours and then they're back to their yeah. normal selves. So, so, I mean, are you recommending, you've been, we've been recommending this mm -hmm. to young women. I for what age? I'm highly recommending it for my uh, young females, especially um, in that 11 to 12 year old range when hopefully they haven't been sexually active. Because that's, when the eff that's where the efficacy lies. Before they've had sexual activity and sex. exposure. There is some efficacy still if they've had a, just a few partners, <coughs> but it's, it's truly not as good as those girls who, and boys probably, who right. haven't had intercourse at all. Right, and not had an exposure. Of course, exactly. well, of course, we wouldn't think that our children are ever going to have sex. I mean, it's sort of like children thinking that their parents, no, they never have sex. Right. I mean, it's the same right. ridiculous right. point. Of course, sex occurs as people get older in particular. And so the risk of that, in, uh, that pap papillomavirus can bring cancer later on in life. And we could prevent cancer uh, with this. It's just, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. Any other comments that we should finish be uh, on this topic before we move on? I had a caller, this is not a pediatric issue, a 75-year-old woman whose blood pressure is 98 over 62 in the left arm and 136 over 70 in the right arm. Does this mean there could be a problem? And the answer is yes, there could be an obstruction. Mm -hmm. You need to go in and see your doctor. Exactly. Would you make any exactly. comment? No. Exactly. But that's not a pediatric issue, but go in and be seen. Okay. Uh, what? cold medicine can I use for my 18 month old? Let's talk colds. Okay, so right now is a, there's a lot of colds. There's a particularly a, a, a mean cold called the RSV. Let's talk about it. Go ahead. <laughs> RSV is respiratory syncytial virus and overall it's either the second or third most common cause of, of colds and for most individuals that's all it is, a common cold. If you have children, your child has had RSV multiple times and you wouldn't specifically know, know, know that. Where you run into problems is the children under six months of age, those t tend to get very ill with it and some of those are, end up being hospitalized for oxygen therapy and more intensive breathing management. And for the last two, three weeks, we've been seeing a, a big outbreak of, of RSV. But in older kids, it's not any different than any other common cold symptoms. Okay. Yeah, just a lot of coughing, a lot of nasal uh, congestion. Mm. Um, high fevers, 102, 103, but generally no more than what three days at the m right. at the most. So it doesn't, and it doesn't cause any long-term consequences. That's uh, some of the questions I've been getting just, from parents. They just it's get just sick. they just get sick, and it obstructs their airways, so their oxygen levels get low, and that's what we worry about is oh, when their oxygen levels and get the, low. And the right thing to do is an antibiotic. No. It's no, viral. <laughs> it's a viral, so the yeah. antibiotic doesn't work. No. You know, I, we do see a lot of ear infections on top of it because of all the nasal congestion and it blocks the ears. So, so a, lot of, a lot of kids who have a secondary ear infection with it will get antibiotics. And then an but antibiotic. But we're not using it for the RSV. Do not take an no. antibiotic for it. There's nothing to give them. No. Just lots of good love and support. A little burst of steroid, maybe? No. You don't give the steroid. I do give, give steroid. I mean, the, the, the medical literature is kind of split on right. that, but I, if they're wheezing, I, I see yeah. some benefit in using steroids yeah. because it, it decreases that in, inflammation. So I, I think it's very low risk to use steroids for five days, and yeah. I've seen benefit at least in some of my, my patients, so I tend to do and that. And I usually don't, mm -hmm. unless they come back in and you know, it, it, they're still having problems, then I'll, I think one kid in the last few weeks I've given uh, a burst of steroids, but majority of them, you know, I'm doing nebulizers to kind of help with that, with that airway movement. Um, of course, some, a lot of them have been, at least the babies have been hospitalized for the oxygen dependency that yeah. they need. Um, but otherwise, it's a lot of bulb suctioning, um, just, just to keep them clean. And Tylenol, and ibuprofen to keep them comfortable. Keep them comfortable and Fluids. Go. Keep them going. Yeah, yeah nothing yeah. to do. Uh, right. RSV, if they're younger, they're very, very, very young, very premature, they're special treatments. There is a, um, an immunization to prevent that during, um, I think it starts October through March. 
um, to try to um, decrease the risk of getting RSV. And so those babies who have been premature or have chronic lung disease are getting that immunization. I like to say that if someone has a hint of asthma in kids to adults to very old people and they catch a cold, I'm, I have a tendency to give the steroid. But, you know, it, it just uh, it sets them up for a risk of an infection, so we know that too. It's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. well, let's run through some questions fast, okay. okay? Quick answers. Is it normal that my son always defies me and is always in a bad mood? I don't know how old the, the, the son is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what age group, I think, right? Yeah, but somewhere around 12, they turn into monsters until oh. they're 22. I mean, you know, the aliens come down, trade them, you have an alien for about 10 years, and then well, that's a know. joke. You haven't heard that. Well, I'm, I'm seeing in my 8-year-old, so. <laughs> <laughs> what should I look for if a child has a hernia? Craig. Hernia is just a weak spot in the, in the muscle, so it's a bulge. And it's more common in boys usually notice a, a bulge down in the groin. And if you notice that, you should come in and have that he evaluated. Yep. Doesn't ne always need to be treated. No. no. I, um, as a guy who's had two hernias repaired, I can tell you I, I went a long time before I started having bad symptoms. Right. And then I had it repaired and then I had the next one come up. And, it, and I see it a lot in like the little infant babies, you know. In the um, umbil umbilicus. In, in the um umbilicus and parents get really concerned about it but you know and I they just tell them the warning signs and a majority of them heal up on their own and don't yes. require surgery. Yeah, which is belly button great. hernia. Exactly. An Audi. Exactly. How long should cyanosis stick around after a baby is born? Cyanosis, color blue. You know, how, how long does a bluish baby hang around bluish? Well, it's normal for the hands and feet to be, be blue for, for hours afterwards, but the, their face and the central part of their body should not, not be blue. If that's blue for more than a few minutes, then there's probably a, a problem, and we, mm -hmm. we worry about either the heart or the lungs or some other type of, of or condition. Or blood vessel problem. I mean, a, a blood cell problem too, you know, too many red mm -hmm. cells. Or, but mm -hmm. it's interesting, heart classic is a heart abnormality. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can I, I use well water to mix my baby's formula? Ooh. Should have it tested. Um, yeah, because of the nitrates. Is, right. What, what about nitrates? That gives you what color of a, ba of a baby? Could turn your baby blue. <laughs> yeah. And so <laughs> what's that story? It could kill your baby. Yeah. And so that's why you should have your well water tested. I mean, most water around here, I think, is indeed safe, but you should should have it tested before you use it in, for your baby. Mm -hmm. Any, Shelby? Nope, I agree with that. It needs to be tested. Should my breastfed baby be on vitamin D or fluoride? The, the new recommendation is yes. They just recently increased the the amount of, of vitamin D that babies re require, and especially in a climate of like South Dakota where we don't get sunlight exposure for, for a prolonged period of time, mm -hmm. they need it. Formula fed babies don't get it, don't need it, because it's in their it's formula. It's in their formula. But the breastfed, it doesn't come through the breast milk, and okay. there's studies that really document that. So yeah, we are recommending it for our breastfed babies. Vitamin D, vitamin D. Vitamin yes. D. Your favorite. Vitamin. As the years, <laughs> as the years go by, I feel like I'm turning into a true cynic. I'm especially critical of pushing the advance of technology when it costs so very much, carries with it significant risk, and then doesn't offer a better result for the patient. Take, for example, ordering CAT scans of the head for children or adults who have had minor head trauma. In a blink, it adds $2,000 plus to the bill, causes significant lifetime radiation exposure, and unless the trauma resulted in a change in mental status or loss of consciousness, does not improve outcomes over simply monitoring the child through the night, which you should do anyway. Yet expectations of family and liability risks have made CAT scans of the head almost standard of care for minor head trauma. I find myself um, critical of excessive surgeries. There are studies finding many more back surgeries in certain parts of the country compared with others, causing great expense, significant risk, no evidence of less pain as a result. The C-section rate is significantly higher in one community than another, also expensive, risky, and without improved health statistics for the mother or baby. Take a look at cholesterol-lowering medicine, which accounts for a $55 billion a year expense to our country, causes significant side effects of muscle pain, especially in the elderly, worse when they get older, 
While for people who have not already had a heart attack, there is no good evidence or science to show statins prevent heart attacks or save lives. What's more, many patients may have a false sense of security by taking these drugs and are thus less willing to make good lifestyle choices such as exercising daily and a healthy diet, which do make a difference. But there is something in modern medicine that gets tremendous bang for the buck, carries very low risk, and has made a huge impact on the health of millions of people in this country and worldwide. This is the technology of targeted stimulation of the individual immune system with vaccine. Immunization programs have stopped dreaded polio in the 50s, reduced heart and neural disability from measles in the 60s, wiped smallpox from the earth in the 70s, and greatly reduced life-threatening meningitis, pneumonia, and influenza during the 80s. Just to name a few examples of the suffering that didn't happen because of vaccines and the immune system. I am a cynic, but still awestruck at the value of immunization. So now, you have a chance to respond to my essay there. Craig? I, I totally agree with you. I think immunizations are one of the, the greatest advances in modern medicine. And because we don't see these medical conditions now, are a reflection of how effective they, they, they really are. Yep. Shelby? Well, I agree with you too, um, and you know, every, it seems like you know, every year we're coming up with new vaccines, new vaccines for this, new vaccines for that, and I know parents are getting overwhelmed, but we're doing it uh, to protect, protect everybody, um, prolong their life, you know, um, doing all the things that we want um, to promote our health, which is our ultimate goal. So, so uh, what about the things I've been hearing about? I mean, some parents are going, I know, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have them not take all those shots at the same time. I'm going to ask my doctor to spread them out a little bit at a mm -hmm. time so mm -hmm. that they don't, aren't so traumatized by the vaccine. Is there any data, any scientific data to say that that makes any sense, that it's, it's a good uh, policy, or what's your take on it? I haven't really seen the data on that specific um, routine. Um, you know, I, I just think it's nice to get them all done at the same time. It's less traumatic for the child. So, I mean, they, the next time they see you, they don't get another shot. And the next time they see you, they don't get another shot. I mean, they're just this one time. Exactly. You know, well, you know, in that first year of life, they get, it seems like they get shots every time they come in for their visits. And yeah. it's very frustrating. And so when you get to the nine month visit, which is kind of their freebie, at least in my practice, yeah. that's, the parents are like, oh, really? That's great. <laughs> um, but then, you know, there's a couple others. And once they get to 15 months old and they've had their last set and they're good till they go to kindergarten, I mean, it's just a relief for parents. But, um... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Well, <laughs> they, they, they have, have looked at that issue and spreading out the vaccinations is not medically ben beneficial at all. People think that the immune system gets overwhelmed with all the immunizations at once and that's not, not true. That's not a scientific fact. I personally don't think that there's anything wrong with doing that if that makes the patient and parents feel comfortable because I'd rather they do it that way than say, not I'm not going to immunize my child. Right. But I, I totally agree with, with you. It, it, I think it's, it's more traumatic for the child to, to spread it out and ultimately it's more expensive for the family because they have to keep coming in every four to six weeks for, for, more, for, shots. for, for more shots. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, despite their best efforts, the child's ready to go to kindergarten. Suddenly they are mandated to get a whole bunch of immunizations at one, at one time. And so it's a lot more traumatic to immunize that four or five year old than it would be if, if they were infant. Okay. And four and five year old shots are not fun for the nurses either. No, they're <laughs> probably the worse. Time. The little kid doesn't know anything. Yeah. Yeah. How, uh, how about the thermosol and all of that uh, concern? Do we have quick, quick answers? Is that, is that, are we it's, getting any of that? No, I mean, it's no. bottom line, it's been removed from standard immunizations mm -hmm. and has never been proven to be be really detrimental because all the immunizations together was less mercury than in a can of tuna. So, so a can of tuna, right. A can of tuna is much more mercury <laughs> than you're ever going to expose your children through, 
through it, the immunizations. Yeah. Right. So, uh, take home message, quick. One sentence. <laughs> Craig, she's giggling. Yeah. You value your, your children. They grow up way, t way too fast. There you go. We thank you. Thanks. That closes the book for our show on pediatrics this evening. As Mark Twain said, life would be infinitely better if we could be born at the age of 80 and gradually move towards 18. I sincerely thank our studio guests, family physician Dr. Shelby Eichens of the Avera Medical Group Brookings and pediatrician Dr. Craig Crisman of the Brown Clinic Water Tour. And thank you, our viewers, for watching and calling. Our, your questions and input do make a difference. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for this program is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System. Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.